Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you. Thank you for choosing to participate in this afternoon's multi-faith dialogue on pilgrimage and sacred space. Today, we are invited to listen deeply. Listen deeply to various perspectives. Some of those perspectives may feel familiar and even reassuring. Other viewpoints might be quite different from, from our own and even uncomfortable. We'll see how the afternoon unfolds. But as we listen to presentations from our three panelists and engage with con in conversation with one another, we are invited to build bridges of understanding and a better world by our actions here today. When UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon addressed the 2010 World Summit of Religious Leaders, he said, quote, when we build a culture of understanding and uphold human dignity, we build a better world. We live in a changing and interconnected world where local events can have an impact globally and international events can have a local impact. These 21st century facts compel us to strengthen cooperation, to expand the space for dialogue. The organizers of today's events, and I suspect you as well since you are here, have a passion for expanding the space for dialogue. The organizers standing at the back is Dr. Idrissa Pandit. She's the director of the University of Waterloo's Studies in Islam program, which is housed here at the Renison University College. She's also our timekeeper for today, and so the panelists will be paying particular attention to her with a five-minute warning, and we have chimes if, if that goes beyond that. <laughs> Not a gong, but chimes. <laughs> the second organizer is Dr. Daniel Maatz, who is sitting right over here. Uh, Daniel is a research associate at Montreal's Concordia University and an instructor at Wilfrid Laurier University and a member of local Jewish communities. And my name is Marilyn Malton, and I'm the director of the Renison Institute of Ministry. And we're delighted that each of you has chosen to be here today. We're also grateful for the legacy of Mrs. Helen Marie Wayne, a friend of Renison University College. It's through her generosity that we are able to bring this series of multi-faith dialogues to you. In the first half of the afternoon, we will hear presentations from our three panelists. The second half, we will engage in conversation with them, with one another. So now to our panelists. We'll begin over on my far left, your right. Uh, presenting from a Jewish perspective is Mr. Bob Chodas. He's a longtime member and lay leader of Temple Shalom in Waterloo. Welcome. In the middle is Dr. Wendy Fletcher. She'll be presenting from a Christian perspective, and she is also the principal and vice chancellor of Renison University College and director of international and intercultural development. And thanks for being here on a Saturday. And Mr. Shrez Sheikh, is, he will be presenting from a Muslim perspective. He's a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto's Department of Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations with a focus on knowledge and learning in the early Ottoman period. He's also an instructor here at Renison University College in the course Islam, the West, and the Modern World. Welcome to our panelists and enjoy. Tenth. So, so, so what is a pilgrimage then from a Jewish point of view? Um, and I mean, I thought about it and there, there are sort of different reasons why people travel to different places. I mean, you might go to Florida or the Caribbean for the warm weather, or you might go to Las Vegas for the nightlife, or you might go to, uh, you might go to Whistler or Mont Tremblant for the skiing. So those are reasons that people travel, and, and, and anybody who's a ski enthusiast would, would sort of go to Whistler, you know, whether one is a Jew or a Christian or, a, or Polish or Irish or whatever you are, the only thing that matters is that you enjoy skiing. Um, so pilgrimages are a little different in that um, they're places that you go 
because they're somehow related to your heritage or, or tradition and, and, and that they'll somehow connect you with your heritage or tradition. So, so for example, if you're Irish and you, and you make a trip to Ireland and you visit the village where your great-grandparents came, that's, that's a little closer to the idea of, of a pilgrimage. So, so um, it's not necessarily a religious meaning, but, but it's some kind of deep cultural or heritage or religious meaning that, that would make a trip, a pilgrimage. Um, so, uh, so, so what kind of trips would qualify as that for Jews? And obviously we associate pilgrimage primarily with Israel. And um, I think Daniel raised the question of whether uh, any sort of Jew going to Israel, is that a pilgrimage? And, and he suggested that, that for some Jews it would be and for the others it wouldn't. But, but I think in the sense in which I'm using the word pilgrimage, for <coughs> certainly for the vast majority of Jews, it would be a pilgrimage. It's, I mean, you don't, you know, you might, I mean, there is nightlife in Tel Aviv for sure, but, th but that's not the main reason why most Jews go to Israel. Uh, it has more to do with sort of connecting with some of the roots and sources of their identity. Um, so, so, so that's one kind of pilgrimage, but not all pilgrimage sites for Jews are in Israel by any means. Um, and even in North America, there are places, uh, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, my family and I went to New York and we, we went to the Lower East Side and we went with my father-in-law who, who grew up there and we, you know, we found the house where his grandparents had lived. And um, there's, a, there's a tenement museum uh, on the Lower East Side where you can see sort of how people lived uh, soon after they came to the United States um, a century or more ago. Uh, and if you're Irish, you can get an Irish tour. If you're Italian, you can get an Italian tour. And we, of course, <laughs> did the Jewish tour. Um, so, so that was a pilgrimage. Um, the, and once you go to Europe, there, there are a lot more possibilities. And, and so um, if you look at your, the first uh, side of your sheet, um, I identified a few places in Europe that would qualify as, as pilgrimages. Um, so, so there are many, many uh, old synagogues and old Jewish cemeteries and other old Jewish buildings in, in Europe. And I, I just singled out two here, uh, the Cordova Synagogue and the Old New Synagogue in Prague. Um, they're both... Uh, built around the same time, sort of roughly the year 1300. Um, so, so they're both more than 700 years old. Um, so Cordova in Spain um, was, the, it was the, the center of uh, Islamic civilization in Spain. It, uh, it was the, the caliphate uh, was, was centered in Cordova. Um, and, and the Jews did very, very well um, <coughs> during that period of Islamic civilization. Jews were doctors and poets and philosophers and court officials. Um, so, and, and we refer to the golden age in Spain, and, and, and it eventually all came crashing down with the, um, with the Christian reconquest of Spain. But, but for a period of several centuries, uh, Spain was, was a major center of Jewish civilization. <coughs> so, um, and, and that synagogue in Cordova would be uh, one way of connecting with that period in Jewish history. Um, so, the, now that style, I mean, interestingly enough, it's that style of architecture is referred to as Moorish, and uh, it's been imitated in many other places. Thank you. Um, 
including the United States. You'll find grand synagogues in styles that imitate, um, that imitate the style from Spain of that period. Um, so the old new synagogue in Prague. So, so first of all, why does it have that name? Well, when it was built in uh, the late 13th century, it was the new synagogue. It replaced an older synagogue. But by the 16th century, it wasn't so new anymore, and there were newer synagogues. But the name New Synagogue was, was sort of very firmly established, so, so it began to be referred to as the Old New Synagogue. And, and it was in the 16th century that probably the, the figure in Jewish history who is sort of most associated with this, since, and some of the legends lived, his name was uh, Rabbi Lowe, and he's referred to as the Maharal of Prague. Uh, and, and one of the legends is the legend of the golem. Um, he's, when the Prague Jewish community was in danger, um, he's reported to have fashioned an animate being out of clay, uh, which, um, which was able to protect the Jews from, from their enemies. And, uh, and reportedly, the attic of the old new synagogue was, uh, was the sort of resting place for the golem. So, um, so Prague has a very rich Jewish history, um, but, uh, but this is sort of one of the more interesting aspects of it. Uh, so, so anyway, those are only two of, of many old synagogues in Europe that, that people would visit. Uh, the, the Cordova Synagogue is no longer in use, it's used as a museum, but the, the Prague Synagogue is in use to this day as a synagogue. Um, so now the third uh, site in Europe, which I've chosen, is very different. Um, you'll see there the, the entrance to Auschwitz II Birkenau. Um, <coughs> It's hard to think of the concentration camps as a place of pilgrimage. I mean, they're certainly not holy sites in any sense that, that we would imagine. But, um, but they are a place that many people visit, and, and, and they're actually organized tours. And I think Diana Park, who's going to be speaking here in December, will talk about the March of the Living, which is which is an organized tour to the concentration camps and then to Israel. Um, I guess the question arose uh, after the camps were liberated and after the Nazis were defeated, what are we going to do with these sites? I mean, like one instinct would be just to, to raise them and, you know, to, uh, pretend, you know, forget that this ever happened. And yet, that's not what prevailed. And very early on, uh, Auschwitz was turned into a museum. Uh, and, and, and that's what it's become, and many, many people visit there now. So while it certainly isn't uh, a conventional pilgrimage site in any sense, um, Again, people, like, why would you go to Auschwitz? I mean, it's certainly not, uh, certainly not a pleasant place. It's not a place you would go for pleasure. Uh, but people, f but, but the, the impulse to remember the Holocaust and remember the people who have died and remember the civilization that they came from has, has if anything, only grown stronger in the intervening years. And, uh, and so, actually, a friend of mine was recently on a tour of Eastern Europe, and, and, and the concentration camps were sort of one of the places that, that people visited. So, um, so this is a very different kind of pilgrimage site, but nevertheless, uh, it's a very important one for Jews. Uh, okay, now if you flip over the page, we're going to uh, move to Israel. Um, and uh, so, so as I said, I mean, just going to Israel in and of itself is a form of pilgrimage. But, but there are a number of places in Israel that, uh, 
that would especially qualify as, as pilgrimage sites, and it's especially for, for certain groups of Jews. Um, I think the wall, the, west, the Western Wall, it's sometimes referred to as the Wailing Wall, although uh, you know, Jews prefer not to refer to it in that way. It's, uh, uh, in Hebrew, it's the Kotel Hamar Abi. It's, the, it's actually the wall of the outer courtyard of, of the ancient temple. And it's the only part of that temple that's still standing. Um, and uh, so, so, th so that's an obvious place that, that Jews would want to go. Jews pray there. There's sort of regular services held there. Um, and one of the controversies that's associated with the wall has been um, the place of women at the wall. There is a women's section. But, um, but some women, uh, mostly uh, from non-Orthodox denominations, but, but including some Orthodox feminists, have uh, insisted on praying at the wall with, um, with a prayer shawl, which you know, traditionally, according to Orthodox Judaism, is reserved only for men, and to reading from the Torah, which again, is traditionally reserved only for men, and, and the chief rabbinate in Israel has objected to this, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's sort of been taken to the secular courts, and in uh, 2003, I believe, there was a ruling against the women, but then in 2013, it was overturned. They were allowed to do that, and then uh, the women, but there's still, you know, they still sort of face the hostility of, of ultra-Orthodox men who sort of try to prevent them from doing this. And, and they recently um, held their first bat mitzvah at the wall. Uh, and so how were they going to get a Torah scroll there uh, without sort of attracting the ire of these, of these ultra-Orthodox men? And they found a sort of tiny Torah scroll which is nevertheless sort of ritually correct, but, um, but was just very small, and they managed to smuggle it in and sort of <laughs> hold the bat mitzvah using this tiny Torah scroll. Um, so now Rachel's tomb. Uh, so there, there are three matriarchs, three patriarchs and four matriarchs, uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then uh, it, you know, Abraham's wife Sarah, uh, Isaac's wife Rebecca, and then Jacob's two wives, two main wives, uh, Rachel and Leah. And of those seven, uh, six are buried, by tradition, six are buried in the same place, in, in the cave of Machpelah in Hebron. Uh, but Rachel isn't. And, and um, in the in the book of Genesis, the, it's the reason why she's not buried there is given. Um, she, as uh, Jacob and his family were journeying, uh, she gave birth to her second son, Benjamin, and, um, and she died in childbirth on the road, and she was buried there. Now, there's... Uh, even within the Bible, there's some contradiction as to uh, where the actual place that this happened was and where her actual tomb is. But, but there's this one place in Bethlehem that, that sort of by the consensus of the tradition became the site of Rachel's tomb. And there's that building that's built on it. Uh, you'll see the Hebrew lettering. It says, Kever Rachel Imenu. Uh, the uh, grave of Rachel, our mother. Um, now, Rachel's sort of, she's always the odd person out among the patriarchs and matriarchs. And she kind of has, because she's not, you know, she's not buried in the same place because she died young in, in childbirth. And, and she has a status as sort of our, our mother of sorrows. Um, she had this sort of tragic life and then her um, the tragedy sort of went beyond her death uh, when her children were 
um, the, the sort of northern kingdom of Israel, which was the first one to be destroyed by the Assyrians, was uh, the leading tribes in that kingdom were, were from her sons. Um, so, uh, so, so, so that's another part of the tragedy of Rachel. And there's this very uh, poignant verse in, in the book of Jeremiah about you know, a voice is heard in Ramah, uh, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children because they are not. Uh, and God hears that prayer. So, so there's the sense of Rachel having kind of almost the special, that God hears Rachel even more than uh, the other patriarchs and matriarchs. And, and so, uh, so to pray at Rachel's tomb there's a sense that, now we don't have intercessory prayer, although this is kind of skirting the edge of it, but, but we, don't have, we don't pray to somebody to pray for us. We pray with Rachel. Uh, so we pray, we take upon us, by praying at Rachel's tomb, we take upon us the merit of Rachel uh, so that God will, will hear us. And, and prayers at Rachel's tomb are often for people who are sick, people who are in some kind of trouble or other. Uh, so then the third site here, um, I'm going up, is Masada. Um, Masada is in the desert, overlooking the Dead Sea. Um, this is the place where, um, so in between 66 and 73 CE, uh, there was a revolt against Rome by, uh, that was led by a group known as the Zealots. So, so you can imagine what their orientation would be if that's kind of the name they took for themselves. They were, uh, they were very militant, I, you know, I think we, uh, in all our traditions, we sort of have people of similar orientation now. Uh, and, and the revolt, I think, as, as many such uh, endeavors are, was a disaster. Uh, it led to the destruction of the temple. Uh, but there was a group that held out in this. I mean, you can see what a dramatic setting it is and what a, how difficult it would be to capture that. There was a fortress built on the top of it. And, King Herod had built a palace. Uh, so, um, so, that's, so that's where they held out, and the Romans eventually came to sort of 100,000 strong and, uh, and, and were about to capture the fortress, and roughly 1,000 people there committed mass suicide. So, so this site was only rediscovered in the 19th century, and it, it only became uh, a sort of major focus of Jewish interest in 1942, when um, there had been sort of Jew uh, clashes between the Jewish and Arab residents of Palestine. Um, the Nazis were, the German troops were marching across North Africa, and and, and the British under Montgomery had not yet begun to roll them back. So there was a definite possibility that they would conquer Palestine. So, so Masada became, uh, and, and a Zionist leader named Shmaryahu Gutman uh, led an expedition of youth up Masada and kind of captured people's imaginations. And, and from then on, Masada has become a sort of major focus of archaeology in Israel. Um, for a time, it was where the Israeli Defense Forces sort of administered the swearing-in ceremony to some of their troops. People even talk about a Masada complex or a Masada syndrome in Israel. But, but it has been a very powerful, uh, powerful symbol. So the last one, I don't have much time, it's, but it's actually, for me, the most interesting. Um, the tomb of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai uh, in Meiron. Meiron is in the Upper Galilee. It's very close to Tzfat, which was the uh, center of, of the Jewish mystics in the 16th century. 
And one of those mystics, the, the, the leading light of that group, uh, uh, Rabbi Isaac Luria, he was always identifying, like he just knew sort of where the graves of holy people were. So, so he identified this site as the, the grave of Shimon Bar Yochai. Shimon Bar Yochai was a second century rabbi uh, who, um, by tradition, is the author of the Zohar. The Zohar being the sort of leading medieval text of uh, Kabbalah. Uh, now, modern scholarship has sort of uh, is very skeptical about this, that you know, it's supposed to have been a text that was lost for a thousand years. In fact, it's uh, now more widely believed that it was written in, in 13th century Spain. But if you ask a traditional Jew, you will sti still hear that Shimon bar Yochai is the author of the Zohar. And he's reported to have died on Lagba Omer, which in most of the Jewish world is a, a minor festival in the spring. But for ultra-Orthodox Jews, and especially Hasidic Jews, the largest gathering, regularly scheduled gathering of the year takes place in Meiron on Lagba Omer, which is supposed to be his death date and the date when he um, expounded all these mystical teachings that became the Zohar. Uh, and hundreds, like there are buses, there are uh, special police protection, hundreds of thousands of people come to Meiron on that day, and they, there's lighting of bonfires, there's dancing, there's a ceremony where uh, boys who are three years old get their first haircuts. Um, and and uh, you can actually, it's actually televised live, and you can, there are a lot of YouTube videos of, of this ceremony. So, so that's a pilgrimage site uh, throughout the year, but, it's, but, it's, but especially on that one day, Lagba Omer. Uh, so I think I'm out of time. So that, that just gives you a sense of, of the range of some of the uh, Jewish pilgrimage sites in Israel and outside. Good afternoon. Um, it seems presumptuous of me to um, attempt such a project. To speak for a Christian perspective is a, is, a, is a pretty broad undertaking. You're probably aware that currently there are more than 20,000 uh, 20, distinct denominational groupings within Christianity. Roman Catholicism is one of those, uh, representing roughly 50% of the Christian world. So I think it's important to just identify a little bit about my location. So I am an Anglican, I'm a cradle Anglican, uh, and I'm a historian by trade. So in attempting to approach the question of what is pilgrimage from a Christian perspective, those are my, those are my context, if you will, those things that have shaped my view, view of the universe. I, as with my colleague, first asked myself the question, what do I understand pilgrimage to be? Um, and for me, in terms of a Christian uh, motif for understanding pilgrimage, I, I think for me I define it really as two things, both the journey toward God uh, and the journey in God, both. That then left me um, with being confronted by my own real understanding, which is that for me, as a Christian in this generation, I understand the theme of pilgrimage to be predominantly metaphorical not solely metaphorical, but predominantly metaphorical. There is absolutely within Christianity a tradition of physical pilgrimage, of going to uh, particular places, travel to the Holy Land. Particularly in the medieval uh, church, we see pilgrimage as, as a motif, uh, sadly, often associated with things like crusades, actually, but often pilgrimages to places where there had been uh, a claim of a miracle where the power of the Holy Spirit was thought to be particularly active or in resonance. But in this generation for Christians, I think that the notion of pilgrimage is predominantly metaphorical. So that's what I'd like to talk about, I think. Um, pilgrimage in three forms within the Christian world as we know it today. The first being physical, the, the notion that we move toward God uh, and encounter God in physical spaces. The physical spaces, I think, for Christians are twofold. The first 
kind of physical space that the Christians have always acknowledged as the context for encounter with God, the place of encounter with God is the natural world. We call that early on in our theological undertakings natural revelation that God is there in the sunset, in the mountains, in the trees, in an encounter with the natural world as it is. There we encounter God, we come to God, we find God. And very early on in our tradition as we grew into something other than a movement and became a religious institution, we started building spaces that we thought might reflect and contain God and named those as sacred spaces. We call those churches. Yeah? Um, but for me, in terms of my own particular spiritual journey, physical space has never been the primary way in which I engage the theme of pilgrimage. My, it's, it's not been the primary way in which I have encountered God, although I'm a, a weekly Christian and love lovely churches. For me, it's the other two faces of pilgrimage that have been more significant for me. And the first, of course, is the notion of, <coughs> of, of pilgrimage and the sacred space that goes with pilgrimage as interior space. Yeah? The, the space that is inside of the disciple, the uh, interior space that is inside of the seeker, inside of the pilgrim, as the place of primary engagement with and encounter with and movement toward God. And then the third place, which has been very, very, very significant for the Christians, is the notion of sacred space as the gathered community as the body of Christ. So we have a notion of, of, of sacred space, of finding God in the gathered community in a very particular kind of way. Uh, in most of Christian history, these two things have been very strongly linked. That if one is not undertaking the journey to, uh, toward God, of knowing God in the self, one has a hard time experiencing and knowing and understanding God in the sacred space of the body of Christ or of the gathered community. So. <coughs> Excuse me, I thought I'd like to talk first of all then about this whole notion of pilgrimage, of movement, of the sacred space of the interior self or the interior journey as the place where God lives. For Christians, I think the first thing that they know about themselves as human beings, the first thing they know is that they are made in the image of God. Uh, the Imago Dei for Christians is a central piece of our theology, that somehow in the act of our creation, uh, we were made in the image of God. What that means, how we interpret that, has been variously configured throughout the centuries. Thank you. <coughs> but that somehow, the image of God, resides in us, at the center of us if, as human beings. We have entirely entrust, trusted in that. So how do we find that? What is this pilgrim journey then, this movement toward God and id God in the interior space? How do we take that? How do we undertake it? Various Christians across the centuries have understood that variously, but the, the tradition that I like best, that I think has been most helpful for uh, Christian pilgrims and Christian mystics across many centuries has been something that um, they have called the spirituality of detachment. So that's what I'd like to talk about um, as, as one understanding of the sacred space of the interior journey uh, of the pilgrim and God, the whole practice of a spirituality of detachment. <clears throat> the first thinking about this, this way of understanding the journey into God um, as space really arose maybe in the theology of Paul, but we won't go back that far. We'll go to the fourth century with this whole notion of Christ, Christian practice known as desert spirituality. Have any of you heard of the desert, desert fathers and mothers of the fourth century? They were people as Christianity became very uh, urban and very connected to power. They decided that they were going to practice their spirituality as distinctive and went into the desert spaces and lived in combinations of, of life as hermits and hermits in community as prayers, as uh, uh, practitioners of the way, but apart from the mainstream practice of Christianity. So they had this image of the heart of the human dilemma, right? They said there was one thing that kept human beings more than any other thing from being able to encounter God, to, be, to being able to in, succeed in their, their pilgrim journey toward God. And they talked about that as acidie or despair. Uh, that somehow at the heart of the human being, in terms of all the complexity of this life and this journey, there was a, a, a bit of a broken heart. This, this spirit that could sense God and move toward God and sought God, but at the same time never found God, and so lived in a constant state, if you will, of, uh, of despair. The problem with that sense of apathy or despair was that it can paralyze people. There was the, the medieval mystics picked up this tradition many centuries later, and one of them wrote a play called The Life 
of any man. And in this play, uh, I'll just t tell you this story to encapsulate the wisdom in terms of, in terms of what was, was meant here. Um, the central figure of this play was Satan. And he was not a Hollywood caricature of Satan. He was um, an ordinary man, an ordinary person like you and I. And in this play, he went through various scenes of human drama. There was the plague, there was war, there was violence, there was poverty, there was disaster of every kind. And in this, into every scene, the figure of Satan would walk. He'd simply walk into the middle of it. And he had only one line. Everywhere he went, he would reach out, he would have sympathy for the suffering of the people that were around him, and he would put his hand out and he would say, oh, there's nothing to be done, nothing to be done. You see the encapsulation? If we are so overwhelmed by the complexity of life that we become paralyzed and believe that there is nothing to be done, then the way of death has won, in terms of that Christian parable of meaning. So in the desert tradition, picked up later by the medieval mystics and alive and well in our Christian tradition today, is the notion that there is one way to push back against that dilemma, that, that the only true way to move away from despair and apathy and the paralysis that that gives, which means we never do encounter God in our journey, is this notion that compassion, if you will, is the antidote. In this way of seeing God, it was understood that God as love, God is love, God was love as compassion. And that if you and I were made in the image of God, then at the heart of us also was this very heart, a heart of love, which was the heart of compassion. And that if we could touch that in the interior space of us, that holy space of the meaning of God, which was compassion, then we would rise up to the occasion of our own discipleship life and, and live, if you will, and overcome anything that would immobilize us and keep us from seeking life at all costs. <clears throat> so they developed then what they understood to be the spirituality of detachment or the practice of detachment as a way of finding that imago Dei, that God at the center, that heart of compassion. And the basic wisdom was not detachment in the sense of we don't care, just forget everything, let it all go, but was the notion that we need to let go of anything that keeps us from looking at this world through the eyes of God first, through the heart of God first, anything that we prioritized that kept us from being able to see with God's eye needed to be released, whether that was our illusions about the world, the illusions about ourselves, our physical attachments, whatever it was, we needed to simply set that aside and let it be there and be ones who longed to look with the heart of God toward this world as the first thing. When I was a, <clears throat> a new teacher about 25 years ago, I was a, a theology teacher at Huron College, which is just down the road at Western. And I was big into the theology of detachment. I'd read everything I could get my hands on. I taught about it. But I remember the time when I actually realized I didn't have one clue about living it and how, how graphically it hit me. I'd like to share this brief example of it, this illustration with you. I, it, I call it in my own mind my purple shoes story. Yeah? I come from a, a long line of women who like shoes. Yeah? My mom loves shoes, my grandmother loves shoes, my great-grandmother loves shoes, we, my daughters love shoes, shoes. I have a lot of shoes, shoes of every kind and every color. <coughs> <coughs> I was a new teacher at Huron. I was the only female teacher. That meant that whenever we had a female faculty person from away that was visiting, I was the host. So this one particular cold southwestern Ontario winter, the snow was up to here, uh, we were going to have for a week a visitor from Indonesia uh, through, sent to us through the student Christian movement. The day came for her to arrive. I went. I met her at the front door of the college. I took her to my office. I hung up her coat. <clears throat> I said to her, you can leave your boots there. You can just put your shoes on, leave your boots with your coat here in my office. We'll go down and meet the students. And she said, oh, I can't take my boots off. I said, why can't you take your boots off? She said, well, I didn't have a lot of money and I was coming to Canada and I was told that there was a lot of snow here so I had enough money to either buy a pair of boots or a pair of shoes so I bought boots. Well there in the corner of my office behind my door was my pile, you know, my pile <laughs> of southwestern Ontario shoes. So I said, oh well, well just pick a pair of my shoes. So she took her boots off and she looked through my pile and she picked the shoes but she picked my purple shoes. Mm -hmm. Now, my purple shoes were my favorite shoes, my absolute favorite shoes. 
All week long, she wore my purple shoes. It distracted me all week long. <laughs> all week long, every morning I went to my closet to get dressed. I couldn't wear anything that matched my purple shoes. I got to work. I saw her purple shoes. The week came. It ended. She went on her way. And I realized something, that I had spent the whole week so staring at her feet and my shoes that I had missed the face of God passing through the midst of us with grace and wisdom and beauty. It hit me like a ton of bricks, and I got what the Desert Fathers and Mothers were saying. Whatever it is, whatever our purple shoes are, setting those aside so that we can encounter the sacred space of compassion as holy space, and from that space look toward the other and the world. That is our project. Right? That, is our, that is our work. <coughs> So then, <coughs> we'll move a little bit from the sacred space of the interior journey to this whole notion of the body of Christ. This is a hard one. This is a big one. But probably I would argue that for Christians, this is the main pilgrim project. This notion that somehow the place that we actually encounter God on our pilgrim journey, the most sacred space of all is within the community of, of followers, the community of disciples. We would call that as Christians the, the body of Christ. See, the Christians have this bizarre piece of theology which I think we don't actually live as though we understand very often. But at the heart of the Christian tradition is this notion that in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, there was a reordering of the universe, if you will. That everything that was broken and estranged underwent some kind of ontological or essential reconciliation in the Christ event. And that from that moment, everything is seamless. That there is no other, that there is no division. Now, depending on what kind of Christian you are, you may understand that, that, or that as only for the Christians, or only for this group of Christians, or you can be another kind of Christian and believe it's about the reconciliation of everything that God ever made into one unitive reality, one unitive experience. But whichever way you interpret that, the heart of this notion of the reconciliation of all things in Jesus is the heart of a Christian spiritual practice. That means, then, that our job in terms of this movement toward God and to encounter is actually to live as ones who can see that, who can encounter God as the uh, great integrating reality of everything that is in, said in one kind of way. <coughs> Let me say it this way. Um, when I lived in Vancouver for many years, I taught Sunday school um, in a church called St. Michael's East Broadway. St. Michael's East Broadway was in a very poor neighborhood. You may know about the downtown east side in Vancouver. This was just on the edge of the downtown east side of Vancouver. And sad to say, there are tons of kids that live there. This, this is not a world that is only an adult world. It's a world uh, full of kids. So we had this Sunday school at St. Michael's East Broadway, but the kids that came to our Sunday school were, were not as the children I had experienced in London, Ontario when I did Sunday school there. It was a much more complicated and diverse social landscape um, with a lot of suffering in the faces of those kids that showed up for Sunday school every week. And you know what? They were there every week because they didn't really actually have anywhere else to go. Um, there were no sports for them. There were no activities. There were no, so, so they actually were there. And I remember this one Sunday sitting on the, the floor of the hall where we did our Sunday school and all the kids were there and all of their complex brokenness and all of their beauty. And I said to them, where is God? Right? This very question, where is the space we find God? And they gave all of the kinds of answers that Christians have given. One young woman put up her hand and said, up there, God is up there in the heavens. And another young boy thumped his chest and said, God is here. God is inside me. God is here. And one young woman, whose name was Cheetah, she was about five at the time, she came from the most complicated and disadvantaged circumstances of anyone in that Sunday school room. She jumped up into the middle of the circle where we were sitting on the floor and she said, no, no, don't you see? Look, look. She twirled like this. There, there's God rising up from the middle of us. Cheetah saw what was meant yeah, in the Christian tradition about where the most sacred space of all is, where, where the pilgrimage journey takes us toward God, that God is actually there. In the middle of all the complex diversity of our apparent brokenness is this 
God, this God who is one, this God who is healing, this God who is compassion, this God rising up and transfiguring everything about the landscape that we're <coughs> in the middle of. Keeping my eye on the time, I'll, I'll just introduce a couple more notions about that because I think that, that for Christians, this whole notion of sacred space and encountering of God um, out there, in here, and in the circle of the world, um, there comes then a requirement on a life. The next stage is not just that we see that, right? it's not just that we encounter God uh, and understand that God is reconciling all things and God is in all things and God is here, but it becomes incumbent then for the pilgrimage of the Christian to go another chapter, to go another stage, which is to be in the world as ones that actually see that, right? Be in the world as ones that actually get that that God loves our neighbor as much as us, that the very one that we hate and can't forgive is absolutely adored by God even as we are, is absolutely beautiful to God even as we are, to, to go and actually practice an ethic of that, which is a one world ethic, yeah, a one world ethic. The South Africans in their struggle against apartheid had a term that they used, which is a very important term. They had this word, um, Desmond Tutu, if you've heard him talk, you may have heard him talk about it. Nelson Mandela used this term, Ubuntu. Um, and it's, it's an African word, it's an African phrase that actually adverts to this meaning, that we cannot become who we are, we cannot be human beings alone, but that there is an interconnection um, in all things, not just human beings, but all creatures. And that until we live as though we understand that our own well-being intimately affects the well-being of our neighbor and vice versa, um, there's, no, there's no way to actually enflesh the meaning of our own identity, which is to become fully human, which is to live in the image of God, which takes us back to the place where we started. <clears throat> A silly, small story about it, because for me, um, it's a silly story again, like the purple shoes, but I believe that the whole project of you and I in terms of whatever journey we're on, um, from a Christian location, my perspective is that that pilgrimage, that journey is about enfleshing the Ubuntu, the wisdom of the reconciliation of all things in God, um, in a really particular way. Every interaction, not just the big things, not just getting it right in the big things, but in the small things. I was in South Korea. It was a peace conference, ironically. I was there to uh, give a, a, a talk about Indigenous peoples in Canada and the impact of colonization on Indigenous peoples and how one might think into reconciliation beyond, beyond that project. And a stupid thing happened. I forgot my curling iron. Well, my hair, right? Like it's it, it's fuzzball hair, and so I need a curling iron to get it all orderly so I feel okay to go out in public. I f had lo forgotten my curling iron. I looked, oh, what am I going to do? There was another Canadian there, a woman, a bishop actually, an Anglican bishop. I could tell from her hair she was using a curling iron, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I went and I told her my dilemma and I asked her, could I maybe come early to her room each morning and borrow her curling iron? Because I had to stand up in front of 2,000 people and talk and like I had no curling iron. And she said, well, no, that would be very inconvenient for her because she couldn't commit to what her morning schedule would be. I couldn't believe it. So I went about my business. I stayed away from the Canadians after that. I went, <laughs> about, I went about my business, and at lunchtime I saw a group of South African women sitting there, and I just went, and I sat down beside them, and we talked, and they asked how things were going, and you know, I answered honestly. I said, well, it's really it's a great gathering, but I'm feeling really embarrassed because I can't fix my hair. I, I forgot my curling iron. And one woman said to another woman, said to another woman, oh, you have a curling iron, don't you? Or the, and yeah, I have a curling iron, you could loan it. They were totally in a different part of the complex, two miles on the other side of this place where we were staying. It took four hands to pass me that curling iron and get it to me every morning, but did they do it? They did it every morning. Every, I didn't even have to go looking for that curling iron. They brought it to me every morning so that I could then with dignity go about my business and feel, okay, stupid to worry about hair, but the opportunity of that curling iron showed me, right? Like those fragments, those small things, that's actually what Ubuntu means. It means seeing with the eyes of God and compassion of the other to see what they need and their suffering so that we can actually reach toward them even if it costs us something to do it. Ah, so pilgrimage, journey toward God, journey in God. That is what I think the Christians think. I think it's all God. I think the Christians think, although we may not practice it very well, that 
theoretically we think that it's all in God. We're all floating along in this ocean of grace and the ocean of grace spills up out of us and holds us and engulfs us and our project is really to just swim there in that ocean of grace as though we can see it and as though we understand that it's our work to live as though we can see it. Thank you. Uh, so, I was, I was asked uh, to talk about sacred spaces and how they're understood from the Islamic perspective. And uh, only had a short while to put something together, but I feel that this is something that I think will be receptive um, to everyone. Um, I try to keep things to basics. Uh, like the other traditions, there are many examples and similarities and comparative traditional forms of sacred space. Um, in the Islamic world, you can find anything from historical sites to, uh, okay, to shrines um, uh, that are regularly vi uh, visited uh, by, div uh, by believers, by devout Muslims. Um, but I thought what for this presentation, for the, you know, the limited time that we have, that I would just focus on sort of the bare essentials and, and the sort of major, major uh, uh, sacred spaces that all Muslims uh, share and agree on. Um, so in that, in, the, in that sense, I want to focus in on two, on two terms. One is the term that we use to denote uh, our place of prayer, which we refer to as the masjid. I'm sure so many of you have heard that term. Um, in English, we say mosque, which is actually from the French, which is then actually from the Spanish, which then came from the Arabic. So it's mosque, mesquita, masjid. So you can sort of see where the, how that word evolved. But in English, we use the word mosque to, to denote the place of prayer where Muslims uh, do it, offer their prayer. So that's masjid. The other, uh, the other term that I want to talk about is the term haram, haram which I would translate uh, as sanctuary. So those are the two terms that I want to explore in this presentation and uh, with the slides that I've, that I've put together here. Um, firstly, um, the term masjid. <clears throat> uh, the Prophet of God, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, was, was said to have said, uh, the whole earth has been a, a mosque or a masjid and a means of purification for me. So wherever a person of my ummah may be, when the time for prayer come, let him pray. So this has sort of profound implications because here what the prophet is saying, it was just a simple question, probably answering a simple question by a, a, a follower, if I need to pray and there's no mosque around, like what can I do? And the prophet gave him what seems to be a very simple answer. You, if you need to pray, just pray everywhere. The, the, the world is your mosque. Just pray wherever you want to pray. But I think it has even greater significance and greater power in the sense that, wow, the whole world is a sacred space, right? I mean, that has really profound implications. Um, with that said, uh, you know, and that, that ties back into the whole idea of, man, of if human beings being representatives of God on earth, that in the vast cosmos, that God the sovereign, in the vast cosmos, he, he gave us earth as our special place, right? So, Think about that, you know, when you're recycling, or you know, when you're, you know, you're thinking about the environment, and you know, and our, our responsibility to everything that happens in this world. That this is a place that is not just for us to use, but it's our place to connect with our with our divine. Um, but there is a proper understanding of what a masjid is, because we have them. They're 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 around, uh, you know, uh, these places which are considered sacred by Muslims. So I just wanted to look at the two terms, first masjid and, and, and haram, and look at them from an etymological way, and then maybe tie back some sort of historical events and, and instances to kind of flesh out what these words mean. Um, so masjid, again, it's the Arabic word. Uh, the English word is mosque. And the roots, like Arabic, like other Semitic languages, all words in Arabic can be derived from a base triliteral root. Um, so from this tri triliteral root, you can then create a myriad meanings. Uh, so when we look at the word masjid, we, we break it down to its sort of root meaning. So the, the letters are sajada, or sjd, sajada, uh, which has a sense 
the meaning, the sort of essential meaning of that root word is to prostrate or to bow down. Okay, so I think that's interesting that for to understand what is sacred space is a place where it's tied to an act, to a, to a devotional act, and that is to be in submission, to be submission to God, so in, in a place of prostration. So what masjid is, the actual, is actually the, it's the noun of place, the form that's used to, to that's applied to sajid is a noun of place. So, so masjid is a place where one prostrates, it's a place where one prays, and that's what makes a masjid a masjid, a, 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 that it's tied to the devotional act of prayer. Now, later on, scholars would sort of flesh out what makes a masjid over another space. You know, why, why is this particular space considered a masjid and this place not considered a masjid? And there's a lot of sort of aspects of the law that, that inform that. Um, certain conditions might be that this is a place where it is known generally that everyone comes here to pray five times a day. Um, that is, that is that it's marked off by, by space. And, you know, we can look at sort of like the mosques in Istanbul, the big giant blue mosque or the, you know, the Suleimaniyah mosque, these very massive sort of examples of Islamic architecture. Or you can go to the desert and it's just simply a perimeter marked off by rocks. But everybody understands that that is a place of prayer, that is a place of masjid. Um, that it's not owned by anyone, that it's not you know, it's not, it's, not, it's not the property of some particular person. It actually belongs to God. This space is, you know, who owns this place? Well, God owns this place. And, it's, and another aspect of a, of a mosque or a masjid is that it's self-sustaining. That it's something that is either through an endowment um, or through sort of contributions from the, from the community. So it's a shared space. And another aspect that I think is very interesting in that it, it's, it's open. It should be open, and that should be open for anybody to come into. Now, in the tradition, sometimes that's been, that gets you know, delimited, you know, becomes exclusive only for Muslims or whatnot. Um, some, some of the things that I've seen in my travels around the Middle East, like in North Africa, you know, non-Muslims aren't allowed in, in the mosques, but then you go to Turkey and you know, they let anybody come into the mosque. And you can pray the way you want to pray in a mosque in Turkey. And I found that really fascinating and really, I thought that was really connected to the spirit of what a masjid is, or what a mosque is. Um, and the blue mosque, if you ever have the chance of going to Istanbul, you walk into the blue mosque, you'll see that effect that it has on people. Um, I've seen, you know, uh, Catholics walk in there and literally when they walk in, just, they pull out their rosaries and they just start going because they're just blown away by the, you know, the feeling of peace and serenity that, that, that exists in those mosques. So that's masjid. <clears throat> The next term I want to talk about is haram. Now, masjid is something specifically Islamic. That's something that uh, was born when the religion of Islam came into being. The Prophet built a mosque in Medina, uh, which is the city that, where he lived a half of his life. He was born in Mecca, but he, when he lived in Medina, he built a mosque. Um, haram actually has its roots in pre-Islam. Uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. So the idea of a sanctuary or, or, uh, existed uh, before the coming of Islam. Now again, if you look at the root of the word haram, it comes from the word harima, which means prohibited, inviolable, sacred, and consecrated. It's, a, it's an interesting word because it's the same root word that we use to denote something that is forbidden. So when we talk about things like what is permissible in Islam, what is per forbidden in Islam, We'll say that something that's permissible is halal. It's permittable, permissible. You should, you know, you're, you can partake in it. But then the opposite of that is haram, right? Something that even can also denote sinful. Like, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a haram act or that's a sinful uh, thing. But actually the real meaning of the word is forbidden. Something that's been, that a limit has been placed on it. So in that sense, haram can mean something that's inviolable. Something that there's limits put on it. It's a sanctuary. Certain types of behavior are not allowed in the haram. And this is really important when one thinks about sort of the reality of life in the Arabian Peninsula at the time when the Prophet, when the prophet lived. I mean, this is a picture of, this is Mecca. <laughs> Outside Mecca, when you drive out of Mecca. Actually, Mecca is a, is a very modern city now, full of skyscrapers and things like that. But you drive out like five minutes from Mecca, and this is what you see. This is what you're faced with. 
So this photograph was taken just outside on the outskirts of Mecca. It just blew me away. I'm a big Star Wars fan, so when I saw this, I thought, looks like Tatooine. I'm like expecting R2-D2 to kind of roll out somewhere. But that's what life was like in, 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 in the Arabian Peninsula. Up until the modern times, that's what it was like. And so when people lived in the Arabian Peninsula, you were basically, as you know, you're fending for yourselves. And one of the sort of social problems that existed in the Arabian Peninsula was that people would fight for limited resources. They would, you know, tribal battles, tribal warfare constantly. And so an interesting social phenomenon uh, emerged in the Arabian Peninsula where they started to build these sanctuaries. And each tribe would have their own sort of sanctuary where people would go. And the understanding was that when you were in the haram, in these sanctuaries, there would be no fighting. There would be no bickering. Everybody was on their, well, on their best behavior. You know, you put your weapons at the door and you come in. You can buy, sell, trade, have food, be merry. But that, you know, when you're in these sanctified areas that, you know, you, re you resist those carnal urges to, to misbehave. Now, these harams were also tied to what made them sanctuaries. Well, usually it was tied to religion. So in the pre-Islamic, you know, era, they, they worshipped, there were polytheists, they worshipped many gods, and sometimes a sanctuary would be built around a particular idol or a particular deity. Um, uh, Mecca, interestingly, was also a haram, and it was a haram for the people, for the tribe that, from which the prophet came from. Now, interestingly, Mecca was unique in comparison to the other tribes because it, here, I got, I, do I get a picture? Oh, here's another picture of... This is actually outside Medina. So you've got desert in Mecca. You walk out of Medina, you see, you see lava rocks. That's what you see. It's like sharp. You know, it's like, wow, how does life exist here? And that's, like, that's, that's molten lava from a volcano. Uh, it's, a, it's a few hundred years old, but that's sort of like the terrain that you see out there. But this is the picture I wanted to show you because we're talking about the sanctuary. Of course, this is, a, this is what Mecca looks like today. But at the time that I'm talking about, in pre-Islamic Arabia, it was just simply the cube, the, cube, uh, the cube structure in the middle there, which is referred to as the Kaaba. That was there. And the pre-Islamic Arabs, at least according to Islamic tradition, according to Islamic tradition, the pre-Islamic Arabs recognized that this was a building of, some, of significance, that it was built by Abraham, okay? And it was also the place where uh, Abraham's uh, consort, uh, Hagar, in Arabic we say Hajar, but Hagar, I'm sure everybody, you, you've heard of Hagar, uh, that this was the place where Hagar was left by Abraham, or sent um, by Abraham, uh, with, her, with her son uh, Ishmael, and this is where they established themselves. Uh, when Ishmael had come to a maturity, Abraham came back and the, him and Ishmael built this structure, which is known as the Kaaba. Now, it's gone through several iterations. It's not the same way that it's been there. It's, you know, it's accepted that it's been broken down and reconstructed several times. Um, but that's the sort of significance of what that is. Now, the pre-Islamic Arabs recognized it as being, you know, that it was Abraham's doing, that he, Abraham had built this. So the pre-Islamic Arabs, even though they were polytheists, recognized this. Um, <clears throat> Now, the story goes that when Abraham uh, sent Hagar there, and it's interesting in Islamic tradition, she was sent there, and then according to the Quran, as a trial. Not for any other reason. It was a trial. So there's, I don't, I'm not really familiar with sort of other traditions, but that's how Islamic tradition understood Hagar, uh, that she went there. But at that time, uh, there was nothing there. It was just all desert. And she was uh, with her child, Ishmael, Ismail, it was just a baby. Um, and it came to the situation where she began to panic because there was no food, there was no water. And the story goes that she ran between two hills, Safa and Marwa, uh, seven times uh, in desperation until uh, Ishmael, who was sitting there all by himself, began to kick at the ground. And out from the ground erupted the well of Zamzam, this ever-flowing source of water that actually still flows today. It's an incredible source of water in an area which you would never even think could support that type of, you know, that type of life. Um, so she began to live in that spot, and, the, and the, as the story goes, as legend has it, 
the Arabs that lived in the area would travel through and they noticed, oh, there's water here. And they would come and they'd top off and they'd talk to her and everything. And eventually they'd say, do you, do you mind if we kind of live here with you? <laughs> you know, kind of build this city around you because this is fantastic. And she, she welcomed them. And so Hagar and Abraham are recognized personalities in the Arabian Peninsula. That tradition existed, even though by the time of, of the Prophet's time, um, the, uh, the, Air, the Kaaba was surrounded by the idols of the, of the Arab polytheists. Uh, that when Muhammad did finally come, he made sure to remove the, poly, uh, to the idols and bring, it, bring the Kaaba and the area, the Haram back to its original, original sense. Here's another picture during the daytime. Now all these pictures are taken during the Hajj pilgrimage that happens annually. Um, we just had it, I think about a month ago. Now, in, this, in an Islamic tradition, we follow a lunar calendar, so it always falls 11 days behind the Gregorian calendar. So it's always moving back 11 days, from our perspective anyways. Um, so uh, this is, and on average, the pilgrimage usually number is about 2 million, although in 2012, we had the highest number of 3 million uh, participants, which is huge because if you think in the 1930s, I mean, it was like in the tens of thousands, maybe I think there were like 38,000 people who went on pilgrimage in 1930, compared to now, right? So it's like a huge, huge, huge uh, change. Now, when it comes to, when Islam came and, and, and sort of brought the pristine form of the Kaaba and the, and, the, and the area back, this area was then known as the Masjid al-Haram. So it's actually taken those two terms I talk about, Masjid and Haram, Haram, and joined them together and, and became Masjid al-Haram, and this is mentioned in the Qur'an. So this becomes sort of the, the holiest site. And then in, during the time, time of the Prophet who made his migration to another city, which is just north of Mecca, a city called Medina, where he lived the rest of his days in Medina, um, where he built his mosque and is actually currently buried there, um, the Prophet extended the notion of Haram to Medina as well. So when Muslims talk about Haram, when they talk about the sanctuaries, they're talking about the two sanctuaries, one in Medina, one in Mecca, and sometimes they refer to it as Haramain. In Arabic, you have this, you know, you have singular, plural, but you also have this dual function. So the Haram becomes Haramain. So you talk about the Haramain, you're talking about Mecca as a sanctuary, and you're talking about the, uh, the sanctuary in Medina where the Prophet is buried. <clears throat> Here's another view. Focal lens, you know, from a, it's taken probably from the tower clock, which is, which was built recently. Uh, so it kind of give you a sense of just how big the structure is. Um, I'm just going to move over here and kind of point to the two hills that I talked about here and here. So this was the area in which is tr tradition had that uh, Hagar ran back and forth searching for water, and the Zamzam was actually it's actually here. Um, it was before just an actual well, like a giant well. Now it's completely co covered off and it's, the well is submerged underground and, and people receive the water through a piping system. <clears throat> now, the thing about sanctuaries is that when these became sanctuaries, they became sanctuaries in exclusion to all other sanctuaries. Right? So when we talk about the ultimate sacred space in Islam, in the Islamic tradition, it is the, it is the haram but there's only two harams. It's Mecca and Medina. Those are the two harams. All the other harams are in exclusion to all others. And this has been something that Muslims have, uh, you know, uh, you know they, there's, there's really no tolerance to allow for any other sorts of sanctuaries uh, reaching that type of level because they want to uh, maintain the, the uniqueness and the majesty of, the, of that haram. Um, so that's why, you know, there's n not even extension. Now, interestingly, the, the mosque in Jerusalem, you know, you've seen the picture of the Temple Mount, and you've seen the Dome of the Rock and area. Popularly, that area is called Al-Haram al-Sharif. And there's been sort of an, an attempt to, uh, in, so in Islamic tradition, that's kind of made an honorary sanctuary. But actually, this is a debated issue within the Islamic tradition where you know, we, there are some notable scholars in the history of Islamic thought who have, you know, said, well, no, we can't, can't call it a haram in the same sense of the two harams in, 
because those are ex exclusive to that, right? So Al Haram al Sharif is just kind of a uh, a nod, or you know, or kind of like an you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a, a, nom a, a nominated sort of term given to to the to the temple to the Temple Mount. Within the, within the Haram al Sharif, or sorry, within the uh, Masjid al Haram. Uh, there are three sort of uh, items of, or, of, uh, or um, artifacts that make what the masjid is uh, auspicious. And it's interesting because they all tie back to the Abrahamic story and the, and the, ha and the story of Hagar. Uh, if with, the, with the Kaaba being built by Abraham and, and, and Ishmael, the Hajj that is performed there, the pilgrimage that is performed there by Muslims, uh, it's one of the five pillars of Islam. That is a story that's really following the footsteps of Hagar, and it's a celebration of Hagar as the mother of believers and also in the leadership of women. So the rites are kind of dictated by Hagar, but the location of what makes it sacrosanct is the work of Abraham and his son Ishmael. At the front, so, at the, so the three items I talked about, one was the Kaaba, of course. The Kaaba is a cubicle structure built by Abraham and, and Ishmael. And the, the second item is the Maqam of Ibrahim. So this structure here that's sitting here, this gilded sort of structure here, encases what is uh, believed to be the footprints of Abraham, um, which were made while he was building the Kaaba. I think I'll show you another picture here. Here's the same sort of situation at night. Uh, um, here, this is what, if you were to peer into that gilded sort of cage, you'd see this sort of footprint. And I, and I, find, I find cognates, I find similarities in other traditions of, this, of, the, of these types of artifacts that symbolize of footprints. Um, so this is believed to be sort of the pedestal on which Abraham used to build the Kaaba with his son Ishmael. <clears throat> And the, and the, sorry, sorry, the third item, the third artifact, of course, is the Zamzam well, which, which Ishmael discovered while his mother Hagar was looking for, for water. I wanted to show some pictures of the other haram. So we talked about the haram in, in Mecca. I wanted to show some pictures of the haram in Medina and its significance because it's, even though the rites of pilgrimage are, conf, are, are really, all that action that involves the pilgrimage, the hajj properly, happens in, in, uh, Mecca, uh, because Medina is given that auspicious title of Haram as well, Muslims try to go and visit Medina as well on their pilgrimage. But this is usually done either before the pilgrimage arrives in Mecca or, 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 or after. Um, many Muslims prefer to do it after so they can just sort of relax and you know, kind of bask in you know, the, the, you know, sort of the greatness of achieving the pilgrimage um, and sort of Medina's, the, the Prophet's mosque is described as a very sort of peaceful thing. I took this picture on the bus. They say that the first sight of the mosque or the green dome is an auspicious moment. So I looked out the window and took a snap. And everybody, oh, pull it over there. I go, go over there. Oh, yeah, perfect shot. Took a picture of it. I think it came out pretty well. You know, this is this building here. I don't know what. Anyway, so that's the, the golden dome. So what, what I like about this picture, you're seeing the Prophet's mosque and it's sort of the iteration that centuries of Muslims recognize it as. It's a, it's a very small sort of mosque with a green dome, signature green dome, probably built during the 10th century, uh, sort of 9th century Abbasid period. The mosque itself was probably built during the Ottoman period. Um, but here's what the mosque looks like now. Okay, so I, I just caught it from the back when the bus pulled up. This is what actually it looks like from the other end. So it's... So this is what the mosque looks like now. Um, and it really covers the entire city walls of what Medina used to be. So the historic Medina is the mosque, <laughs> right? So whatever the, so that was Medina at one point, but it's now in entirety a mosque. So the whole area is a masjid. Here's another picture of the, of the, of the green dome. Now, other sacred spaces. Uh, again, this is, this is something that becomes a bit of um, 
controversial area, so I didn't want to really want to go into it, but I do want to kind of acknowledge some aspects that of, of sort of historical sites and things that were, were that Muslims uh, revere. This is the mount. This is the mountain in which resides the cave in which the Prophet received the revelation. Um, now, the the Saudi officials they, they discourage people from climbing the mountain for obvious reasons. It's it's, it's not safe, um, but. Despite that, pilgrimage, pilgrims every year will try to go up the, to go up the hill. Um, I, didn't, I didn't attempt that, uh, something that I regret. I should have done it in my young age, but I didn't do it. Um, but I mean, now with the Google, you can find all kinds of pictures. And this is apparently the cave on the top of the mountain. So this is where, you don't have to go there. You can just see it on Google. Um, so this is apparently the cave in which the prophet would reside. So there's other aspects, other places of sacred space. But because of the, uh, you know, the exclusivity of the haram, there's a lot of tension and a lot of controversy over adopting other spaces as sacred. Um, not so much that, sometimes it's because, you know, it's, they feel that it's not scripturally based, but other times it's, they don't want to take away from the auspiciousness of the position of the haram in, in the Islamic tradition. I think I'm out of time. I have two minutes. Oh, okay, good. What do you have any, okay, I don't have any more pictures, sorry. <laughs> I just hit the I just hit the time right on the nose, um, so that uh, so the, so so that's sort of the significance of the um, the, uh, the 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 term masjid and the term haram haram masjid is the idea of, of a sacred space where devotional practice is done. Um, again, according to the prophet, the entire world was is a masjid and should be treated as such, but. Properly speaking, technically speaking, yes, we do have structures that, that become sort of, uh, you know, understood to be masjids uh, or places of prayer. And then you have the idea of sanctuary, which at one time were prolific. There were many sanctuaries in the Arabian Peninsula. But with the, with the arrival of Islam, uh, the, these, these sanctuaries were then uh, delimited and exclusively given to the term, uh, sanctuary was given to the term uh, sort of to the location of Mecca and Medina. So those are the two terms. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. <clears throat>The format for the rest of the afternoon is about conversation. And we're going to begin with uh, three panelists having conversation among themselves for about half an hour. Then we'll have a chance to break into three small groups. Uh, some of the questions that you may have jotted down, you can bring to the small groups. Some of your observations, you may have more once there's dialogue among the three presenters. And then what we'll be doing is uh, you have a chance to pick a couple of questions that your small group wants to ask the panelists, and then we'll continue the conversation in that way. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I have a question for Wendy. <laughs> Um, I mean, you spoke mostly in terms of uh, pilgrimage as a spiritual journey, uh, and yet certainly in Christianity, sort of pilgrimage as a physical journey exists as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about the relationship between the two. How does the, how would the physical journey to a place of pilgrimage enhance the spiritual journey? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think <clears throat> I'm a historian, and in the modern era, right, we've been we've we've used the notion of pilgrimage predominantly as a metaphor, a spiritual metaphor. But certainly, our historical roots have a precedent for physical pilgrimage, and we we do see in many Christian circles now the <clears throat> reclamation of the idea of physical pilgrimage, going back to holy sites, if you will. Um, and we see a, a, a symbolization of the movement towards holy sites and the interior journey combined in the practice of labyrinths. So in my tradition, mm -hmm. we use labyrinths a lot to actually give up some physical engagement with the motif. Thinking of my own experience um, of pilgrimage, I think that unlike um, the Jewish and the uh, Muslim tradition, because of the diversity within Christianity, there isn't 
the same kind of one place to go or the, the same number of easily identifiable spaces. I mean, certainly to go to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem and Bethlehem, yes. If you're a Roman Catholic Christian, you'd go to the Vatican. Um, but in terms of the broad range of, of Christians, even in the medieval period, I think what we saw is that people were very selective about the choice of individual physical spaces that would have some resonance with them. So if they were suffering from a particular kind of illness and there had been a, a healing at a particular site, they would uh, make connection between whatever saint was related to the healing and that location and journey there. So it's been a much more of a dispersed phenomenon. But I think that uh, Christianity is a very enfleshed religion. I mean, the incarnation, the notion of God becoming mm -hmm. flesh is at the centerpiece of our theology. So using one's body in the act of spiritual engagement is very important. So there is the that, I think, in terms of the value of physical pilgrimage, moving of the body. But actually in our Christian liturgy, <coughs> excuse me, we symbolize pilgrimage even in terms of how we go through the liturgy with our bodies in the more liturgical traditions, so Catholic, Orthodox, or <coughs> Anglican, um, that the movements of the body actually reflect um, in a form a reenactment re of bodily engagement with the active pursuit of God, including receipt of the Eucharist or mm -hmm. different other ritual acts. So it's, uh, th I think that's how I'd, I'd answer it, that the notion of physical engagement as a pilgrimage act is, um, is there, but not in the same way that it is with the other two traditions. And how is that sort of manifested in sort of the modern sense? Would you say that it's more, has sort of moved, moved away from physical and more towards a spiritual, you know, because of this modern situation or mm -hmm. would, would that be fair to say? I think in the last hundred years, absolutely, I, I think, but I think in the last hundred years, and particularly the last 50, there's been an upsurge in terms of different Christian groups uh, reclaiming the idea of physical pilgrimage, and it's due to a few things, one of which is the increasing affluence, uh, in mm -hmm. other words, in terms of the Western world Christians, the increasing affluence um, uh, in the last century has allowed people the capacity to travel. Most of the world's Christians now live in the two-thirds world and actually don't um, have the advantage of, of middle-class affluence. So that most, the average Anglican right now is a black African woman, for example, um, who would not have the economic capacity to travel more than 200 miles from her home. So I, I do think there's an economic correlation. So in the middle-class declining West, there's an increase in pilgrimage uh, because people can afford it, uh, but not so much where Christianity is actually thriving and growing because poverty is so much a piece of, of that. That's interesting that you said affluence because I think when it comes to the Islamic, the, the Hajj, the, uh, affluence has actually increased the number of participants in the Hajj. Whereas I think historically, um, it was one of those things that was sort of like a capstone in someone's life. It was something that one would be preparing for for decades, and would do it at a point in their lives where they had, you know, they've paid off their debts, they've taken, they've saved up the money, they've put away money because you're gonna, you're going on this journey for months on end, um, and quite possibly never return. I mean, that's how difficult that journey was. Now it's just simply going to your travel agency and getting a visa and pay 500 buck visa, get, get on a plane and fly there. And so, like I was saying before, 1930 pilgrimage, only maybe 38,000. Now we're up in the, in the, in the millions. Um, so yeah, I, I can see how affluence maybe extends the possibility for pilgrimage. For, for a similar situation with uh, Jewish visits to Israel. I mean. You know, obviously it wasn't the state of Israel at that time, but, but for centuries, I mean, the idea was that people would go to Israel to die and, and be buried there. And in fact, my own great-grandfather uh, in about 1911 or 12 um, went, and, and he was already, you know, actually probably not much older than I am now, but was, would have been considered old in those days. Uh, and he went to Palestine and um, he, you know, with the idea of sort of spending his last years there. And, and as it turned out, I mean, 1914, the First World War came, he had some income from Montreal, some money that was sent to him. And um, because of the war, the, I mean, the, you know, Palestine was then under Ottoman rule, and which was on the other side, so the money couldn't get through. And um, he went with his son, and he, whatever food he could get, he would give to his son, and he ended up dying there, basically of starvation, because 
uh, because of that. But um, again, now to go to Israel, we're actually contemplating a trip ourselves. And you go to a travel agent, and there are any number of airlines that fly there. And, you know, the challenge so. is picking the right package. That's right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but this makes, it makes a really important point in terms of the spiritual uh, impact of Absolutely. pilgrimage, because it's linked, it, historically, it's linked to sacrifice. And the notion that one makes a sacrifice for the kind of encounter with God that will happen through the pilgrimage experience. So the extent to which there is no sacrifice then lessens the spiritual benefit, I suppose, theoretically. Um, Question? Yeah, I think you I can, pa yeah, no, I think you can, uh, on the other hand, it sort of spreads it out to a lot more people than, than uh, it was available to before. Oh, okay, how about this? Um, <laughs> uh, what would you consider, uh, is, there, is there anything similar? I mean, in the Islamic tradition, the, the Hajj is, is a pillar. It's something that every Muslim aspires to do in their lifetime. And, and it's, 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 it's the, one, of the, uh, one of the pillars where it's only obligatory if you have the means to do it. Is there anything similar in, you know, in, in either traditions where um, or maybe just even in scope uh, of uh, you know something that a believer in in your tradition would want to do before you know in their life before you know all said and done. Uh, sure. I I mean again probably the closest thing for the masses would be the the trip to Israel, but it's but it's not necessary. I mean I, that wouldn't have the same kind of religious significance that the Hajj would for Muslims. I mean, it's, it's as, I mean, for many Jews, it's, it's as much a, a cultural experience as it is a religious experience. Or, or, you know, for us, if we go to Israel, I mean, probably the major reason for going is that we have family there. And, and, and many people in North America would have family in Israel. So, so I mean, there are all kinds of different reasons, but, but that would be the closest thing. However, I mean, it seems to me that of the, uh, you know, of the pilgrimage places that I highlighted, the one that would be closest to the experience of the Hajj would be the, the visit to um, Shimon Bar Yochai's grave in Meiron. But that's, I mean, that's just for one particular subset of Jews who sort of, right. who follow that. But, but. It's similar in the sense that it's associated with a particular time and it's associated with a mass of people sort of being there all at the same time. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, I mean, it's not something that they would do sort of once in their lifetime. It's, it's like certainly Israel, like ultra-Orthodox Israeli Jews, like, like every year they would go to Iran. I mean, they, you know, they're there are fleets of buses that go from Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And, and, uh, but, but nevertheless, I mean, just that, that sense of being um, among a mass of people who are sort of there for a spiritual purpose, I think that would be the closest thing. My answer from the Christian perspective is <clears throat> may sound um, um, unexpected, and it certainly reflects my own tradition, which is that I think uh, the, the rituals we practice actually are the only thing that equates the same level of expectation and obligation, and, and even those within only more liturgical tradition. So the Eucharist, for example, in the tradition that I come from, um, the expectation that one prepares for and receives the Eucharist at certain times of the year or at certain points in a life has certainly historically been the case. But with all of Christianity, everything is so denominational and so particular to individual tradition. I don't think there is one, uh, I mean, we've got the scriptures, we've got the creeds, and we've got the, the rituals of baptism and Eucharist that are common, but other than that, right. everything is... Um, that's the common thread. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <clears throat> I, I would say. I have a question about, about, about pilgrimage for both of your traditions. It, does it a, a f shift with gender? Is the expectation of what one um, achieves or experiences or fulfills through pilgrimage uh, different for men and women? 
That's interesting. Um, one of the things that I, I find fascinating about the Haram is that um, it's the great equalizer. Um, Mecca is the only place where men and women actually pray together. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in, in more sort of traditionally in, in, in mosques, uh, the men usually stand up at the front and the women might be in the back or in a, in a separate section. Um, but in the, in, the, in the precinct in Mecca, uh, everyone just prays with everybody. Um, and also, I mean, why I say it's a great equalizer is also because uh, when people go to the Hajj, they're, they're leaving their sort of worldly st uh, status and money behind. And they, in the, when they're in the state of ihram, again, another word that comes from haram, uh, or in a state of um, the sanctity of, as a pilgrim, they're just wearing, you know, very simple, uh, simple loincloths and a simple shawl. Women wear, women wear like a one, two-piece sewn outfit. Um, but the sense is that when you go there, everyone is equal before the eyes of God. And it's, it's, so, it's kind of like a metaphor for the last day when we'll all be resurrected in front of our Lord. Um, so... It's it's interesting to say that because for m when men and women do the pilgrimage, they're doing it side by side, and same sort of requirements are expected uh, while they do it. And it seems to be that Mecca is the exception. So the present the, the mosque there is an exception. Um, yeah, I. I mean, I don't know that that in the overall sense there are different expectations. However. Uh, I mean, I mentioned the women of the wall and the sort of controversy around that. So, so there are things that men are allowed. I mean, first of all, it is gender segregated. I mean, there's a men's section and a women's section, as there would be in any Orthodox synagogue. Uh, and there are different expect. And again, as in any Orthodox synagogue, there would be different expectations of what the men do and what the women do. But, but, but there wouldn't be. I mean, the idea of visiting the wall would be something that both men and women would do. And, and similarly in, you know, the, the pilgrimage to Mehran, I mean, it would be uh, the, the, you know, the actual celebrations, there would be gender segregation, but, but people of both genders would go. Could you reflect on spiritual benefit? So there's the sense of obligation to make a pilgrimage, yeah? But what, what happens? Like what happens is understood happens in the act of pilgrimage? That's a really good question. Uh, um, it, is, it is supposed to be a spiritual journey, one that's rooted in spirituality. Um, I think sometimes the, 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 the struggle is in the modern age uh, is that the ease at which we can, pro we can go um, thankfully, I've had the opportunity to go on Hajj. I, I went on Hajj once, but I went off season twice, so in total three times. Um, unfortunately, in the capacity as a as a group leader, so I didn't really have uh, my my concern was to basically keep the flock together and not lose anyone. Um, so I didn't really get to experience it on a spiritual level, and that's why I feel that I didn't really do my Hajj, and that. That wasn't my hajj, you know, if, if that makes sense. I didn't feel the spiritual connection. Um, and I remember lamenting about it to a colleague of mine. I said, when I was there, I just didn't feel like, well, your mind is elsewhere. You're, you're, you're concerned about everybody else's hajj and making sure their hajj is completed, and you're not concerning yourself with yours. I think yours will come later. I think your, yours is going to be the one where when you reach that sort of, it's going to be an internal moment when you're going to realize that now is your calling and now is your time to go. Whereas before, you were just there as a servant. You were just there to facilitate and make sure everybody else. And there were, we had elderly people with us and all kinds of other, you know. And, you know, I was always concerned making sure that they had a place to stay and, you know, they had food to eat and whether they got on the bus and did we lose anybody in the head counts and everything, you know. Uh, and all in that, I ended up getting lost in a sandstorm. So, <laughs> which was, okay, that was a spiritual yeah, moment. Yeah, I was going to say. Because yeah. I found myself completely lost, and I, I had only one choice was to get to the next station, was to walk through the sandstorm with the other people who didn't have buses. So I got to experience it that way, and I was behind these two Nigerian fellows, and I was like, oh, God, you know, I have to stick with these guys because they're going to get me through this. And I remember that was a really humbling and spiritual moment for me, and I think that's where I realized okay, this is what it's about. I got a little bit of a taste of what maybe it must have been like in the past. Um, 
Yeah, so from a personal sp perspective, I think my spiritual hajj is still needs to happen, even though I've kind of had a, a run through several times. <laughs> yeah. I think in Judaism, I mean, the, the spiritual is sort of so bound up with the cultural and the national and the ethnic, and it's, I mean, you can't really separate those different elements, so, so they're all there. I mean, what I do know is that, um, I mean, many people, when they go to Israel, like, there's, I mean, you never know what it's going to be, but, but, but there will be some moment where, where you'll just feel a kind of connection with the Jewish tradition that, that you never felt before. And I know, like, from, I remember my mother, when, when she went to Israel, telling me that she felt it when she saw the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, mm -hmm. sort of here were, here were our texts and, and just sort of uh, just got a sense of their antiquity and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, what's been passed down to us. For me, um, the first time I went to Israel, I was um, with a, a cousin who lives in Jerusalem and, and uh, it was Shabbat and we went to a service on, on Friday night and, and, you know, part of the liturgy refers to, you know, God, uh, you know, rebuilding Jerusalem, your city, and, and, you know, I've said that prayer many, many times and then, and I said that prayer and I realized, wait a minute, I'm in Jerusalem, you know, <laughs> just, this is a real place, this isn't just sort of some, uh, some abstract notion, but here it is and I'm there, and that, that was sort of my moment of, mm -hmm. of realization. Yeah, I think uh, I, I, a lot of Muslims share that same sort of experience when they see the Kaaba for the first time with their yeah. own eyes. I mean, it's such a symbol in our religion that, you know, you see it everywhere, you go to a Muslim household and it's hanging on the wall, you know, or there's pictures of it, or you see it on the internet, but it's not the same sort of feeling when you actually see it. And it's like what you were saying, what your, what your mother saying, the Dead Sea Scrolls. You suddenly you're hit with the reality of it, that it's, yeah. it's real. It's, it's you know, you know, uh, I think that's really profound for a lot of people. Your answer actually <clears throat> helps me think of a, a slightly different answer to your original question to me. I, I haven't been on a pilgrimage per se, except mm -hmm. I have visited a lot of historic sites, right, mm -hmm. of, of the early Christians. So that whole experience of going to the catacombs where the early mm -hmm. Christians were buried, or where the first Christians gathered for worship. And I remember in the catacombs seeing this woman who'd been a wealthy woman Christian and the name plaque over where she was buried and it was an image of her, like a very rough crude drawing. And there she was, a woman that cared about fashion with her hair mm. piled high on her head and big earrings and her arms lifted in the Oran's position in prayer. And, and the sense of connection, I think that's mm -hmm. where I'm going that's with right. this, yeah. that, that, that whole physical yeah. engagement with history makes a connection that's not um, just uh, metaphysical in terms of, the, for Christians, the communion of saints, but, but very linear as well across time and space? I mean, there's, there's a little bit of, like any, uh, I mean, any synagogue anywhere in the world will have a, a Torah school, right? And uh, the Torah school is, uh, I mean, it's hand copied, you know, there are all kinds of rules about how it, sort of has to be done on, on parchment with a particular kind of pen and a particular kind of ink, not using metal because metal is used for instruments of war and so forth. So, so uh, and, and, and that tradition of copying these scrolls has, uh, dates back to ancient times. So, so even though the, the particular scroll that you're seeing might not have that, you know, might, uh, I mean, it could have been copied last year, or it could be a couple of hundred years old, but, but, the, but the tradition that it comes from, the, the, the sort of chain of transmission, uh, goes back to ancient times. And, and just the experience of sort of uh, seeing the Torah, and especially reading from the Torah and chanting from it in, you know, again, according to traditions that have been laid down for at least a thousand years. Uh, you get a bit of that sense of, I mean, that's one way you can get a bit of that sense of connection, even mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Right now, you have a chance to enter more actively into the conversation. We'll break into groups of three, and if each of you could join one of the groups, please. And uh, just talk with each other. It, it could be some questions that you have, places, uh, something that was said either, either in the presentations or in this conversation here that caught your attention, you feel a place of connection, you still have a question about. Simply have a conversation with each other, and we'll take about 20 minutes. So, Wendy, do you believe that the inclination toward pilgrimage is more a result of affluence? Actually, can I expand on the question? Sure. Yeah, the physical pilgrimage is, is merely an artifact of affluence because we hear about things like El Camino and it's getting all kinds of activity, yeah. uh, like attention and, and other kinds of physical pilgrimage is lost. Yeah. No, I, I think no. I think I think the reason it's less common in the Christian tradition over the centuries is is just because it hasn't been enshrined as one of our central spiritual practices as normative across all all of our practices. My point about the affluence is is that for Western Christianity, which is in huge decline, I think the affluence is a piece because it makes it possible um, so that, that the affluence links to actually achieving the pilgrimage, but whether or not it is the desire for pilgrimage, I think there is a basic innate desire for journey in individuals for seeking after, of connecting, and that that is, the, that is the basic human inclination that all religious traditions build on with regard to pilgrimage. So I think the inclination is there, the capacity is just greater in Western wealthy nations. Okay, a second question then is, and I think each can uh, respond to this, uh, is there a sense of those who participate in pilgrimage, is there a sense of exclusivism with respect to pilgrimage, whether it has to do with financial ability or whether it has to do with uh, prioritization or hierarchy, any kind of exclusivism in pilgrimage in your traditions or uh, proceed that way? Um, I think it depends, w like, um, which pilgrimages you're talking about. I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, for most, most of the places that I sort of identified as places of pilgrimage, that would not be the case. Um, I think in the case of the, the trip to Meron on, on Lagba Omer, I mean, it's, um, so it's mostly Hasidic Jews who do this, and, and, and Hasidic Jews, uh, I mean, are not only sort of somewhat separate from other Jews, but, but they're sort of sects within the, the Hasidic Jews, and, and, and uh, so the, so at the ceremonies that may run, I mean, there are different groups that sort of have different roles. Like the, one of the groups are the Bayaner Hasidim, and, and, and it's the Bayaner Rebbe who always lights the first bonfire. So, so there's that kind of, so, so you go as a member of your group, you go as a follower of the Bayaner Rebbe, and you're there to light, you know, as he lights the first bonfire. Or, or other groups would have other roles, and it's all sort of worked out among them. So there is that kind of, uh, I wouldn't say exclusivity, but certainly, certainly particularity to the way that you would do this. I think most of the other places are just, um, I mean, obviously at the wall there's the, the exclusivity of the men's and women's sections. I mean, that's uh, and the, the attempted exclusivity of, of only, of certain rituals being reserved only for men, uh, which women are challenging. But, um, but there's no exclusivity, um, I mean, of who visits the wall. It's, it's, a, it's a place where anybody, Jew or non-Jew, can, can go. Um, well, ideally, there shouldn't be any exclusivity. Uh, um, but the reality is that perhaps that happens. Um, at, at least in the Hajj, uh, there should not be any sort of distinction made between people's class or ethnicity or, or even gender. There shouldn't be any sort of, you know, demarcations made. Um, but um, I, I remember once talking, uh, presenting on the Hajj to some of my students, and I mentioned that, you know, uh, 
everybody goes in you know a similar outfit uh, similar style similar dress and then she, she she said well until they get back to the hotel <laughs> and i go well yes that's true i guess that that happens um naturally if you have money you're going to go back to the mecca hilton yes there really is a mecca hilton right um versus maybe somebody who goes back to you know the one star hotel which you know just has you know continental breakfast in the morning so i mean i think but that's that is not something that would be true to the ideal that that what the hajj is supposed to be espousing but that's unfortunately a reality that 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 happens um so yeah so <clears throat> Given how I've answered the question about pilgrimage as being very denominationally particular and largely connected to ritual and individual spaces, I think I'd like to answer the question more strongly as exclusive than you have in either of your traditions. That, there, that our access to sacred space across the story of the Christian tradition has had many, many exclusivities in it across time. So we set broadly in terms of pilgrimage as access to sacred space, we have all kinds of traditions about who's allowed to go where and who can be where. So prior to the ordination of women in many of our traditions, women were not allowed in sanctuaries. Um, in the 19th century, when the new urban industrial class was emerging, both Methodist, Anglican, also Presbyterian churches, you paid for the pew that you sat in, in the church. And so the more money you had, the closer to the holy, holy space you could be in terms of the sanctuary. Up until the 1960s in the province of British Columbia, where I've been serving and working for the last 14 years, in the Anglican churches in Prince George and Prince Rupert, if you happened to be uh, Indigenous or First Nations, you were only allowed to sit in the back two rows of the church so that you would not contaminate the holy space closer to the altar. So our tradition as Christians has been filled with exclusivities in terms of how we have divided things and access to sacred space. This is probably related as well. Um, each tradition has a key element uh, focusing on compassion. And so the question would be framed, does and if so, how does compassion function in pilgrimage? Um, hadn't really thought about that. I, um, well, I guess one, I mean, again, just sort of going back to the different places that I've identified. I mean, I, I think there are a couple there that um, where compassion would come in. And one, uh, certainly the, like a visit to a concentration camp. I mean, like what is the purpose of visiting a concentration camp? I mean, it, you know, uh, and I mean, it's remembering, it's uh, sort of dedicating yourself to the idea that, that this shouldn't happen again. And, and, and it's in some sense, compassion and, and, you know, putting yourself, like, just kind of as much as possible, just reliving that experience of what it was like to be in a concentration camp. I mean, you know, just even just, like, seeing that picture of the, the railway track and the, you know, that, that entrance into Birkenau and knowing that the people who were on those cars, um, I mean, that, that, you know, they were headed straight for the gas chambers. I mean, that's a very chilling experience. And, and, and you know, just to, just to imagine that. So, so I mean, that would, be, uh, that would be one area where compassion would come in. Another, another one where I think there, that is part of it is the Rachel's tomb. I mean, I think that, that the, the the quality that, that, that Rachel embodies, that people are trying to connect with in visiting Rachel's tomb is compassion. And, and uh, so, anyway, thanks. Um, well, I think the, I, we, might, we had this discussion too in, in our group. Um, I think one of the, a, a sort of real challenge when it comes to dealing with ritual is sometimes getting, um, uh, lost of the inner reality or the inner meanings of, of the ritual. So I think the challenge then um, for at least for Muslims when they perform their rites and rituals that they keep in mind what perhaps is the, the wisdom or, or inner meaning of these rituals. In the Hajj there is a there is a component of the Hajj at the very end where, where one 
indul- um, partakes in sacrifice, where uh, they they sacrifice a, a, a ram or a goat, uh, and the and the, and the food is and the meat is distributed to the poor. So there's that sense, but that could get easily lost. The meaning of that could get easily lost, where you're constantly trust, trying to fulfill the ritual and not seeing sort of what that element is. Another element uh, of compassion that probably comes in is that when you are actually doing the pilgrimage, um, it's actually a group effort. It's something that you. It's not something you do by yourself. You're, you're even if you show up by yourself, you're, you're immediately overwhelmed by just the number of people there. And it's just interesting how, you know. You could take two people that were probably at war <laughs> and you put them in that sort of situation and they're brothers and sisters for that day, you know, because they're all working on a singular purpose. So I, I, I see that compact and it's hard. It's not very t- tangential. That's something that you can um, necessarily point to. But it's, it's, it's a feeling that you see that when people kind of help each other, a complete strangers help one another out um, to get through because of the sort of singular purpose that they share. So it's, it's, it's abstract, I guess you can say. From the Christian perspective, I think I'd answer it two different ways. For much much of the Christian tradition, the nature of God has been under for Christians has been understood to be pure compassion. So there's a sense in which union with God is union with compassion itself. I mean that that is what the heart of God is. But but there's a second way I'd like to answer it, which is w- with the literal definition of the word compassion. The Latin root of the word compassion it means with suffering, right? With suffering. And you see that, that strain all the way through uh, Christian uh, journeying, this notion that part of the purpose of the Christian journey is to be united with God and God's suffering or the suffering of Christ. So many of the medieval pilgrimages actually were very, both literally and metaphorically, geared around that, that it was to understand the suffering of the Christ so that one could understand what sacrifice God made and thereby understand the love of God for the other. In more contemporary terms, that whole notion of compassion or with suffering has been very, very um, strong in the justice traditions of Protestant Christianity and in Catholic Christianity as well, this notion of entering into the suffering of the other, not to fix it or take it away, but as God did in the person of Jesus to transfiguring it so that people are not standing in their suffering alone. Um, A couple more questions I think we have time for. Um, This is a a uh, question dealing a bit with what Shiraz had uh, talked about. How is pilgrimage affected by tension around taking a pilgrimage to a place where perhaps there's war or there's mm-hmm. real political uh, challenge? Um, I mean, <laughs> obviously that's the case in... in <laughs> You know, Israel, Palestine, I mean, and, and the places of pilgrimage uh, uh, have also been sources of conflict. I mean, that's, that's sort of the irony. I mean, it, you know, uh, the, uh, I mean, for example, the, uh, you know, the cave of Machpelah in, in Hebron, which is uh, holy to both uh, Jews and Muslims, and and there have been some times when they've sort of, you know, effectively managed it as both a, a Jewish and Muslim sacred space together. But there have been a lot of other times when, when that hasn't been the case, and 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 it's been the source of conflict. Rachel's tomb, as well, in Bethlehem, uh, is also uh, regarded as a, as an Islamic holy space, and 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 there's been a lot of conflict surrounding that. Uh, I mean, that's, I mean, I, you know, I don't really have an answer to the question. It's, it's, it's just sort of one of the, uh, you know, one of those great ironies and, and, and uh, I mean, you know, something, something we really need to work on, something we, we really need to overcome. I mean, the sense that I mean, there's always going to be this, like it goes back to that question about exclusivity. I mean, there is always going to be the sense in some people's minds. I mean, the, uh, I mean, the, you know, they're, they're, they're different, like, like the Jewish tradition is a very particular tradition. <coughs> I mean, it's a tradition of Jews. Uh, 
But that can be regarded in different ways. I mean, it, you know, it can be regarded in a very sort of closed way that, that you know, therefore our space is our space alone and nobody else has any right to it or, or you know, we use that space in a particular way and other people use that space in a different way. So, so, so when we're going to get there, I don't know, but, but, but that, you know, <laughs> that would be my prayer with Rachel. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with Bob. I, um, I think that, you know, when it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But when it does, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and, I, and I didn't, well, I mean, I, I mentioned a story when, in my group and about 20 years ago when I was 19, I had the privilege, the awesome privilege of going to Jerusalem. Um, and uh, funny story, I, I, I was walking what I thought was towards the Dome of the Rock, but I think I took the wrong turn. And I ended up at the Western Wall, but I didn't know it was the Western Wall. And the guys there, they, they stopped me, and they're, you know, they're checking me, and they, they looked through my passport. And I had, a, I, had a, I had a Saudi Arabian stamp in my passport. But they just looked at me and said, you've been to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia? And I was like, uh, yeah, I mean, what's wrong with that? And I was like, okay, whatever, shalom alaikum. <laughs> and, and then I walked through, and I'm like, oh, okay, I think I made a wrong turn. But... <laughs> But, you know, it was, it, you know, no one bothered me, no one harassed me, no one said anything. And, you know, I got to be there and, you know, I, I got to experience it. And, I, and, I, and so I think at that moment, moment it worked. And then another, another thing I was telling a story about when I, I was 19 and I showed up at night in, in, in the holy city and I ended up staying on, on a roof of a hostel. And I heard, um, I guess, an imam start reciting the Quran in the middle of the night not exactly sure what time it was, but I noticed that as he recited, it actually woke woke up the uh, the Jews uh, at night, and they were walking towards, I guess, assuming the Western Wall for their prayer. And when they're coming on their way back, that's when the Muslims got up and went for their morning prayer. And then when they came back, the sun was set, and then that's when you saw the Christian procession down the Via Della Rosa. So. Yeah, there's tension, but at, there's these moments of beauty where it just all seems to work. And I think those are the moments that we need to kind of celebrate and kind of point at and kind of say, listen, it's been happening, you know, for the last hundreds, thousands of years, right? So there must be something we're doing right. <laughs> so I think, I, think, I think that's sort of what we need to kind of focus on and maybe make that a prayer. I guess, yeah, and, and I mean, another place that, that I referred to that, that would... Uh, you know, has to do with that. I mean, that the the whole story of, of Spain in the Middle Ages, and, yeah. and uh, you know, which is has a completely different history from from the rest of Europe at that time, and 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 because there were sort of Christians, Muslims, and Jews, uh, and again, it's not that there wasn't conflict, but there were there were long periods of. Um, of of cooperation and mutual enrichment and and I mean that's another model that we can look at. So. I totally agree with my colleagues. The only other piece I'd add from the Christian story, which is not a very pretty thread, but is the medieval thread, which is that quite often, not only was pilgrimage not discouraged through conflict and violence, but pilgrimage ran alongside it in terms of the crusade. So uh, reconquering the world for Christ. Um, in other words, the violence that went with spiritual pr pilgrimage was intermarried. <coughs> so we've come to near the end, and um, I remember a lot of radio announcers with panels saying, um, we have one final question, but we don't have much time. Could you give us a 30 to 45 <laughs> second response? And usually you hear the music going into the news right. uh, as one of the panel members is still talking, but I'm gonna try that. Um, in 30 to 45 seconds, I wonder what you would consider the foremost benefit of pilgrimage? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess uh, I mean we talked about this in our in our group, and and I mean I think it's for me it's a sense of connection. It's it's um, it it kind of gives a reality to to your tradition and to what you're doing that that um, 
that you don't generally get without actually sort of going to some of the places where, where it originated or where it has flourished in the past. For me, I think pilgrimage is a process of clarification and of coming home, of dropping away on the journey things that don't matter so that one can come home to God and the self and the things that matter. See, that's why I, I go that way, because I, I let them go first. Because I, I agree completely with all that connection. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I'd add to that um, is renewal. So, and, and particularly with the Hajj, it's an opportunity to kind of renew and there's people talk about the sense of being reborn after going on pilgrimage. So, so connection. Uh, um, sorry, what you clarification, clarification coming, home. coming home, and renewal. So, there you go. Wow. Forty-five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Before I say a few words of conclusion and appreciation, <coughs> I want to remind us all that in December on the 13th, another Saturday, uh, we will have the third in this series, third and final uh, component of this series on pilgrimage and pilgrimages, uh, sorry, uh, stories of pilgrims and pilgrimages. And uh, we will have at that time uh, Diana Park, uh, she's a board member with Temple Shalom in Waterloo, Arthur Burrs, uh, he is a, an associate professor at Tyndale University College and Seminary in Toronto, and our own Idrissa Pandit, Director of Studies in Islam here at Renison University College. And I invite you all to come, and I know that it will be a dynamic, uh, because it will be the stories of the pilgrimages themselves. Um, I was reminded as we were talking, a couple of different things that wove together for me had to do with footwear. Um, and certainly when these uh, purple shoes just, you know, captured my imagination. And then when Bob uh, was talking about, um, and, and I appreciate the humility in that story, because I think that that's one of the elements of pilgrimage when we attach or connect with our own spirituality and that of our histories. Um, we find ourselves humbled by the uh, long-standing tradition and the depth of uh, connectivity with God and with community. And, and so I very much appreciated the uh, willingness to be so open uh, and humble uh, with the Purple Shoes story. And that got my mind thinking about when Bob was showing us uh, the image of the concentration camp, and I remembered being at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, uh, the museum of the historical uh, evidences of the Holocaust and uh, the reminder so that never again. And there's one particular uh, picture uh, that stays with me and that's a room of the shoes of the children at one of the camps and it's just overwhelming. And, and that, again, I, I have to say is, you know, one of those sadder moments that it's unfortunate that we have to remember, but it, it is still real. And then um, I checked this out with Adrissa, um, and in the Hajj, uh, there is an obligation to be without footwear. The ground on which you stand is holy. Mm -hmm. And we all share that in our traditions. Uh, and so I, I find that uh, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim this good news. Uh, so I'd like to conclude with that and thank Shiraz and Bob and Wendy for engaging us uh, so beautifully and so educatively uh, in uh, such a profound topic. Thank you very much. Thank you.